Thank you very much for coming back from that uh, fantastic coffee break. I, I barely came back myself. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how tendon and bone attach to one another. It's, it's one of the most amazing structural interfaces that you can find in nature. It's also one of the worst surgical procedures you can find in all of medicine. So it, the, the idea is that the uh, is that so tendon and bone, the two nanocomposites, and this is a theme throughout all of nature. So nature prefers uh, composite materials and, and it is across species. So all, all the way from, from plants to dinosaurs to, to exoskeletons, they're the composite materials. The biggest structural problem that an animal has is, is the interface. And so the, so the, the body has multiple composite materials with different properties. And does anyone here actually eat asparagus? I just realized this is a bad example as I was eating a much better uh, snack upstairs. No one eats asparagus? Okay, well asparagus, you, so just for Mark and only Mark. The, 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 the idea is that, so, so asparagus is an example of this problem. So when you, when you have the big plant on the right, uh, it's a solid stem. It's really resistant to being eaten by a cow. But when Mark raids these things with their babies, they're, uh, you, you pick them up, and they're, they're, they're two different composite materials. There's, there's a clean uh, break between the, this woody bottom and the more fibrous top. It, it just snaps right there. And that, that's a problem not only, in, uh, not only in nature, but in engineering as well. I mean, every, uh, every airplane that's not made by a St. Louis company has this problem of of the occasional stabilizer falling in your backyard. You call the Army Corps of Engineers, it's a mess. The idea is that there are multiple composite materials there as well. So where Boeing spends most of its effort, what delayed the Dreamliner the most, was designing these green regions, these, these interfaces between the composite materials. Anyway, so this, so just as one more note of introduction, this is a problem throughout nature and physiology. My, my group focuses on these interfaces, particularly structural but also electrical uh, interfaces. And, and, uh, and uh, this, any time you have two materials coming together, that's a normal source of pathology. But anyway, what I want to talk about is this, is this tendon to bone attachment in the top right area. And so let's, let's introduce the players. The, uh, so so the, this picture on the right, that's what you get if you were to have lift all the muscles off the shoulder. So this is looking straight up my right shoulder. That's the humeral head. And then, then that other picture on the side, that, that's now on, on the left side, and that's what you get if you, if you run me through a sawmill vertically, and actually a rat through a, a sawmill vertically. And so the, the idea there is that there is a, a highly graded material, a very, a very interesting structure in, in this material. It's also the source of one of the most common injuries that, uh, that affect people. The, uh, almost every octogenarian is unable to, 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 uh, to play tennis because the rotator cuff has torn. And, the, and, the, and this, 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 uh, this tendon, which is part of the rotator cuff of the humeral head, that's the supraspinatus, comes separated from the bone or as an injury. So, so what, what do you do? So you, you, you have a tear. Uh, you go to a doctor, and this is what they do. This is, uh, th so you take the supraspinatus tendon after it's injured, you cut off some of the, th some of the tissue at the end that's kind of torn and ragged, drill a hole through the bone. There are lots of versions of this. This is a very simple surgery. It's actually a bit of an antiquated picture. And then, then you sew it to the, uh, to the humeral head. I, you do that elsewhere in the body. When two bones break, you put them together, they heal. What's the big deal here? Well, so the idea is that it's, it's a big challenge. So the, 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 these, I'm going to show some uh, numbers here that, uh, that, that uh, and actually I want to go through some of these numbers because they're kind of surprising. The, the idea is that a, a bone is more or less isotropic, less, but more or less isotropic, about 20 GPA. And then there's also a huge, there's a huge mismatch in the stiffness between tendon and bone. 
So tendon, tendon, the number we like to use is about 600 GPA. Uh, other people use uh, smaller numbers. But the number we're confident in is over there on the corner, a huge Poisson mismatch. So the Poisson ratio for tendon on the order of three. It's a highly anisotropic material, so that's, that's thermodynamically allowable. So huge mismatch. And what happens when you have a mismatch? So, so you're all familiar with the bogey type singularity. Uh, this kind of builds off of the Williams solution from the 1950s. Uh, you, you solve one of these problems that you, that you, when you really look closely at one of these problems that you solve as an undergrad, there, there's a stress concentration that shows up. In fact, it's a singularity that, that uh, shows up at the corner. And it's, uh, it, it can show up at the corner for a certain mismatch in material properties. So uh, if you haven't seen this, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit busy here, but you can look at all possible mismatches between two isotropic materials, and certainly tendon is not isotropic or linear or elastic, but let's so get a sense of the problem here. So, you, so in, in this shaded space on this graph is a representation of the space that, uh, that, that's, uh, that uh, for Dunder's parameters, so all possible material mismatches show up here. And in the brown regions, you don't actually have a singularity. In, in, the, in the tan regions, they're, they're, when you put the two materials together, put, put any two materials together with kind of a butt joint, you get the singularity. And the, the hatched region of the corner, that's where the tendon to bone interface lies. It's basically the worst imaginable mismatch you can have in, in all of nature. And uh, it's, it's, of course, it depends on lots of other things. We'll go into it, but it depends on the angle of attachment and such. But, uh, but the idea is that if, if you have, with say, ten, an approximation of tendon and bone, uh, sort of in, in a, an attachment angle below about 50 degrees, th there's an infinite stress there. You expect it to break. And, and this, uh, one more slide to highlight how bad of a problem this is. The, uh, uh, so usually when you have a fracture mechanics problem, you're not so worried about the infinite stress that shows up at a crack tip because uh, metals, plastics, uh, lots of materials right, look like that blue stress strain curve for steel. The idea is that when something bad starts happening, the, 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 uh, the stiffness kind of tapers off a bit. And so, uh, so stresses get transferred away from the crack tip. It's the diametric opposite in tendon. This is a, this is a reasonable stress strain curve for tendon. Uh, and it's concave up. So as soon as something bad starts happening, the material gets stiffer and stress concentrations rise. So, so anyway, with, with, this, with this in hand, you guys as engineers uh, would, would look at something like this and expect, expect it to fail uh, uh, 99 times out of 100. But it turns out you'd be wrong. It, it, uh, because it really fails only 94 times out of 100. That's, uh, that's in older populations. And that's why, uh, that's presumably why uh, many octogenarians don't ever bother getting the rotator cuff fixed. This is for an older population, but even for grad students, uh, the, this is, uh, the, the failure rates are in the order of 20 to 80%. This is re-tears over a few years. Anyway, so that's the backdrop. The story I want to tell is about, and this theme which is focused on designing uh, nano and biological interfaces. The story I want to tell is, is about how you can put a, a, a tissue engineered solution in place that will help out. And our material of choice for now is PLGA nanofibers. These are materials that will go in, provide stability over some period of time, and then, then dissolve away as the body hopefully regenerates realistic material. Normally in healing of tendon to bone, there's a, there, normally in healing of tendon to bone, you never regenerate what's there originally. You just have this horrific scar material that's not so tough. So here's what I want to talk about in the last few minutes. The, uh, so the, there are three challenges here. The first challenge is what, what's actually there? So what should the body be trying to regenerate, what should be trying to put together there? Uh, the, the answer is really not known. Second is how can we actually guide cells to do the right thing? So, I, so we, go in, we go in with the surgical procedure, we end up with scar tissue. What we really want is what's there originally. We want, we want the, the tissue to grow. That, that involves providing uh, cues to cells that make them, uh, that, that force them to uh, regenerate in, in, in uh, the proper way and adopt the proper phenotype. And then the third thing we want to do is provide stability during that, uh, during the healing phase. So as the body regenerates, 
usable tissue interface, we want people to be able to use both hands when riding a bull because it's really dangerous otherwise. All right, so, so anyway, the, the focus on is, uh, it is bits and pieces from this kind of busy uh, figure. This is just out of a, this is the, this is part of a Euro one uh, project that, uh, that uh, several people are on, Marcus Bueller from MIT, Yanni Chassiosis, who is here at, at Illinois, but not here. Thanks, Yanni. Uh, and the, Pedro Poste Castaneda from Penn, and then my, my colleague in the orthopedic surgery department, Stavros Thomopoulos. The idea is we, we want to understand what's going on across scales. And, the, and so we, we want to go all the way from understanding the, the fiber level, fiber level behavior, the nanoscale, across hierarchies to fibers and tissues, and then all the way up to the organ level uh, in, in, the, uh, in the body. So anyway, we, we, we wrote a kind of course review of, of this. And it looks like there are, there are four classes of toughening uh, mechanisms that are important at the tendon to bone interface. The first is just what you would ex what, what you'd want to do with sort of a 1950s to 1970s understanding of mechanics. The, the idea is that the, there, there, are, there is gross shaping of the, of the tendon to bone attachment, even in the body. And the body is sensitive to that. We run optimization studies, and you get kind of what you expect, that the body tries to knock out structural uh, singularities. And, that's, and, and so I'm not, I don't want to talk about that today. Uh, another part uh, that I'm not going to talk about today is the fact that and this doesn't come out clean on the screen. I'm sorry about that. But, the, but the, the, there's this picture of, of interdigitation. So the, the tendon and bone have a smooth gradient between them that, that we'll talk about in a moment. But that smooth gradient is riding on top of a, a, a very, a very uh, bumpy interface. And those bumps, uh, we believe, have important consequences for stress transfer and for, uh, and, and for uh, failure resistance, or, or more, more importantly, resilience, uh, injury resistance. The, but the two areas we want to talk about today are, are, are first, just sort of the, the material grading. What, what does, what, what does the, this gradient of material properties mean mechanically for load transfer? And second, how can, we, uh, how can we start tissue engineering some of the mechanisms that we hope are going to start coming out of our studies on, on how, uh, uh, and how uh, that, that enable the tendon to bone attachment to resist stresses across hierarchies? All right, so, so let's start talking about this gradient down here. The, uh, the, the gradient, the, this, this, is where, this is our starting point back uh, a decade ago. Our colleague Savros Thomopoulos did the first ever test on one of these tendon to bone attachments, put it in an instron, measured strains very coarsely, and came up with something that, we were, uh, that seemed to be an artifact, that between tendon and bone, the, it, the largest structural mismatch you can find in all of nature, the, between tendon and bone, the, there's a region that's more compliant than either tendon or bone. And these are with very tight error bars. The error bars are actually inside the dots here. So, so there is this compliant region. And so we asked the question, what, you know, why on earth would you do that? And what, what would you want between tendon and bone? And just kind of to give a back of the envelope understanding of why this might be useful, we looked at this highly idealized problem. So we, we, we took this tendon to bone attachment we uh, and then just idealized it just in an axiometric way, and and then so this is really only a valid uh, approximation for kind of at the middle of the supraspinatus and tendon, which is right at the top. So th so there's there's this this layer of tendon, uh, which is which is cylindrical orthotropic, this this blob of bone, which is isotropic, and then in between we just let material properties uh, vary however they wanted to. So we did ran an optimization study, and. So what, what we would expect as engineers is that, is that if you wanted lower stress concentrations, start at the stiffness of bone, work your way linearly down to that of tendon, and, and, uh, and, and, and try to smooth things out that way. But it turns out you could do much better than that. The, uh, so actually, the, 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 blue, the blue dotted line is the one to follow here. It's kind of hard to see them. So if, if, if you optimize the, if you optimize the, uh, the, the distribution of stiffnesses, you can actually get a, a stress versus a radial stress versus position curve in which the bone is almost entirely shielded from stress, 
and all the stresses inside the insertion site, which is the devoted attachment region, are lower than the stresses, the radial stresses that you have in the tendon. And the way that's achieved is actually by what the body's doing. So the, the, the way you achieve this, and again, let's focus on the, the blue lines. The, 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 the way you achieve this is by having dips in, a dip in the, in the axial stiffness of the region and a concomitant dip in the, in the, uh, in the transverse uh, stiffness of the region that, that allows stresses to be transferred out radially. So you can actually, sh so we believe that, these, that this gradient is actually shielding the, the uh, attachment site from, from high stresses. So great, so let's figure out, so then our next step was, how, can you, how does this happen? How do you make this? So we did the obvious thing, we used uh, Raman spectroscopy, looked at mineral distributions across the insertion site, but then we had this result, and we were so upset with Jill Pesteris, our, our colleague in, in uh, mineralogy about this, but, but it, turns out, it turns out it's right. The, uh, between tendon and bone, there's basically a linear gradient in stiffness, uh, excuse me, linear gradient in, gradient in the amount of mineralization. And this is really stiff mineral, 110 GPA, or so we think. Uh, uh, 110 GPA stiffness of uh, mineral going on linearly. Where on earth does this dip come from? So, but it turns out we spent a lot of time on this and the, the, uh, jumping to the chase, there's a competing uh, distribution and orientation of the fibers. So, so there's, a, there's a gradient, a linear gradient to mineralization and then then fibers become disorganized as you go from tendon to bone. And that disorganization drops the stiffness of the tissue more than the mineral makes the tissue rise before the percolation threshold. And I'm going to, and there are also biologic factors. All right, so if we want to know how much, how much stiffening we need, that's straightforward. We can use this a simple composites approach, a simple, a simple a Flory type or, uh, 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 constitutive model. And, uh, a flurry type averaging over an orientation distribution to get a constitutive model. We have to make some assumptions that I won't go into. All we need to know is, is just how various moduli along a fiber will vary with addition of mineral. So, uh, anyway, so I actually want to take a, a, short, a, a short sidestep here to, a, uh, to, to the paper that out of my entire career took the absolute longest to get through reviewers. That this was, this is a, oh, it's a six year project. It's kind of a fun side story that we had to figure out uh, along the way. And uh, this is something that Vaughn has made uh, a lot of contributions to as well. It's, but it's a, uh, so we, we know what the structure of tendon is. We, we know, we know, we've known since 2001 what the structure of, of a fibril is. So tendons is hierarchical structure, bones pretty much the same thing. You go down from bunches of fibers to individual fibers to these fibrils, uh, to, to, the, to these bundles of fibers, fibrils which have a certain organization, and the fibers which have organization, then fibrils which stack together in a certain way to make fibers. And Orgel from, from Chicago uh, sorted this out in about 2000. And, and so the, it sorted out the structure in about 2000. So the question is, where do you put mineral in this? And it turns out, we were shocked to find that that is actually still to this day a matter of, of really intense uh, a virulent uh, debate. So there, there are three camps here. So the, the, there's the, uh, the, there's of course, the first one is the, is the scanning electron microscopy camp. The idea is that you do an SEM of bone and you see mineral on the inside of fibrils and nowhere else. And, but then there's the AFM community which, which says, are you kidding? You put this in the AFM, mineral everywhere. And, uh, and so, so this, this is uh, from the, the Hansford group, and this is from uh, Dave McComb. Then there's another uh, recent community, which, which, uh, these data came out after we started on this project, uh, where, where, where you, you, do, you, do, uh, you focus on beam milling of a specimen of bone, and you see, and then do TEM, and obviously there's nothing at all on the inside of, of the collagen fibrils. But the thing is, the, so, so the AFM people will, will look at, uh, will we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk to the SEM people and say, well, you know, you know how they do this? They actually, you take bone, you grind it up with a mortar and pestle, and of course all the minerals are missing from the outside. But the, but the SEM people say, no, 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 you guys are out to lunch because, of course, if you have, say, rocks in a bowl of jello, as, as you do with mineral inside collagen, 
and you and you, you you hit on it with a hammer, you don't feel the jello. Everything looks like it's on the outside. And then and then this group as well, I, the, the way iron, iron milling goes, it's like you're taking a fire hose against this nanometer th thick specimen. Of course, you're going to blast out anything on the inside of the of the. Uh, Fireball. So we, we think that we actually resolved this, and after six years in review, uh, six years of arguing uh, with reviewers, we were able to get it published. The, uh, uh, and Vane was a grad student here, by the way. Lesson learned, wait, wait until after tenure to change things that are in textbooks. It takes a long time. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Looking at the model of collagen, looking at the uh, uh, looking at the, sure, not this, the Orgel model of collagen, and seeing how much mineral can fit inside. And the idea is that everyone else who had done this in the past had not actually looked at a realistic structure of collagen. And so, uh, just a, a, a quick movie of, of how it actually works. I'm actually going to. I'm running behind schedule, so I'm going to cut this off. Uh, I'm going to fast forward through half of it. Oops. That is, that's the wrong movie. Here's the right movie. All right, so the, the idea is that there's, there's a certain, uh, so the idea is that there's a structure all the way down at the nanoscale. The structure involves these collagen fibrils, they're not straight, but the, the twist is very minor. So, we're, so, and the twist is actually really going to only uh, come into, uh, come into the, the superstructure, the brave lattice. So we're just going to treat these as, as uh, straight rods. And just for visualization, the, these, these, rods, these rods assemble into these uh, microfibrils. They're not separable units, but this is, this is the repeating unit that goes on the brave lattice. And you should hurry up. All right, and the, these stack together to form, uh, to form uh, this, these stack together in this repeating array. So remember, these are 300 to 1 aspect ratio rods shrunk down. And so you stack these together, and you can form a fibril. So now, we've, now we spread these out. And if you look through these fibrils, the question is, how much mineral can fit on the inside? So, so we, t we take these plates of mineral, and th this is, this is this is now just one brave lattice thick. So it's the thinnest possible plate of mineral you can stub into this. Assume that there's, there's no, this ignore all surface interactions. There are only just a few places along these fibrils where mineral fits in. And so there, it turns out there are five different orientations, three different possible uh, volume fractions of mineral. And, and, uh, and uh, although these, these certainly aren't rigid rods, they're, they're very floppy molecules. Uh, this, this, gives, this allows us to actually get an, uh, at least get an upper bound on how much mineral can fit inside a fibril. And so there's five orientations. We're going to fast forward through the rest. There it is. And uh, the, so, the, so a, fibr a mineralized fibril with mineral on the inside will look something like this. And if we do, so if we do the math, about half the mineral in bone can fit inside these gap channels. So there has to be something on the outside. And, uh, and, the, and, there, and I should... I, I should mention that there are some important contributions. Uh, other people have, 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 uh, have contributed this as well. Yvonne is, is herself actually has, has made observations of, of, these, uh, of these, uh, these gap channel mineralization. And these actually extend from fibril to fibril, across fibrils, making a, a network. And uh, so again, back to this. The, uh, so the, long story short, we have, we have uh, we were then able to develop specific TEM techniques that were able to pick up both the intrafibrillar and extrafibrillar minerals. So it's there. We know it's on the inside and outside. We know where it should be on the inside uh, to, to, to within a, a degree of, uh, of error. And uh, so, so then I, I'm running way behind on this. And this is, uh, and so I'm, actually, I'm, I'm going to jump through this. But uh, we, we don't know the order in which it accumulates between tendon and bone. And we have evidence for, for uh, the extrafibrillar mineral showing up before the intrafibrillar mineral uh, right now, but we're not confident of it. And uh, we, uh, we skip, skip ahead and, and so just to this result, which is that it, it, so that it turns out all that really matters about the sequence of mineralization 
uh, so what we're working on right now, is whether mineral shows up on the outside first or on the inside. Because the, the details of this gradient are really dictated by the speed with which the percolation threshold of extrafibrillar mineral is reached. And so, and, uh, so I only have five minutes left. Uh, and so I'm going to actually jump through the rest of the, the characterization stuff over to just a few words about what we're doing to, to replicate some of these, uh, these mechanisms in a tissue construct. And so the, so uh, let me skip over that introduction as well. So I should say there are two classes of approaches that we take. There's one that I think is going to bore people here to tears. I think I'm going to I plan to skip over unless I see a lot of people perk up right now. So don't perk up if you find this as boring as I do, actually. So the, the, there's this, this game you play where, where you, you look at it, oh, there's a picture being taken. So is it, should we go through this in detail? The, um, there, there's, there's this game you play in which, in which you uh, provide a certain mechanical environment to, to living cells, maybe cyclic loading or something. And then you go in and, uh, and make graphs that look like this. And, and uh, OK, I see a lot of blank looks and yawns. Thank you for the yawn. The, uh, that, that was very instructive. And the, uh, and the, the idea is that you look to see whether, whether the right genes get, get, get uh, turned on in the right place. There's that world as well. There's a more interesting mechanical world, too. So there's, this mechanical world involves providing the right mechanical environments for cells in the tendon to bone attachment to maintain the right phenotype. It's really hard to keep these cells from turning into uh, wound healing cells, myofibroblasts. And we also want to be able to provide real stability so, so people can go back and, uh, and ride bulls with two hands. So the, the, the technology we're working on is with our collaborator, Yunan Shaw. So Yunan uh, has, has pioneered several uh, electrospinning techniques. Has also pioneered an ability to be able to apply a gradient in mineral to one of these, uh, to one of these scaffolds. And so we take these scaffolds, we do, we perform mechanical tests on them. Uh, we get a, a stress strain curve that looks something like is up on the right, so which is which is not the same as we'd expect for a tissue, but at least something that has some some toughness in it before failure, and and we can do optical mapping to get uh, stiffnesses, and uh, it, we can see that uh, it, we can see that that uh, these these scaffolds. Uh, will have the right, to, the right sort of gradient and stiffness along them. This is just optically measured stiffness, so you can really only really trust uh, anything that's averaged over uh, a line. And, and you get, so you get, uh, you're able to get a gradient in, uh, in mineralization that corresponds with some kind of gradient in modulus. So Yudan Shah being Yudan Shah, he published this in, it's probably the cover of, of Nature Materials or something, and then he moved on to his next project. But then we were stuck with getting this to. We sat down and asked, "How how good is the stiffening?" And so, th th these are the, the these are the dots that Yudan uh, gave us, and that Yudan's material gave us. First material gave us, and it turns out th these are the Hashin Strickman bounds, and th these are just parallel and series bounds uh, on on uh, on how much the mineral should be stiffening the the, the PLGA. The answer is this is pretty much the worst you could possibly do for for any uh, for any composite material system. So most of the mineral that's showing up on the outside of these fibrils is doing absolutely nothing at all because there, there's uh, we have we have stiffness we have stiffness measurements below even the the Voigt and Royce bounds, but certainly far below the Hashin Strickman bounds. So anyway, uh, it t turns out that the key here is that is that the, uh, the type of mineral that gets formed, the, ty the type of hydroxyapatite that gets formed and the morphology of it is very sensitive to the kinetics of the, uh, of the formation process. So just by slowing things down, by, by taking out a couple of ions from the this, this simulated body fluid that we immerse these scaffolds in, you can do much better. Uh, and the, uh, so then in the, uh, in, 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 the in the last 60 seconds I have, I'm going to uh, let's go talk about one more topic. <laughs> it, uh, it, I, I, I have four, minutes. Four, four minutes. All right, so a four minute version of, uh, of, the, uh, of how we're now going down to the nanoscale. Right now we're only looking at PLGA. We just got funding to start looking at, at collagen fibrils as well. But, uh, but right here in Illinois, you guys have Yanni Chasiotis, just not right here in this room because 
I, I know he likes me. He must not like you guys. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so, are you, you guys are probably familiar with this device. This is this is probably the most remarkable advance in tensile test technology of the last decade. So, what, what Yanni could do is he 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 mass produces these tensile test machines that work inside an SEM or work over an optical microscope. And then he could take individual fibers and, and tell us what the fibers are doing. It, uh, and so uh, I'm going to condense this down a little bit. The, the bottom line is that we can, we can control a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the mechanical behavior of a fiber just from the morphology. It turns out there's, that, that there's, advantage, there's an advantage to having a, a wavy morphology to the fiber because strain localization actually uh, allows the uh, allows uh, strain hardening to occur, and uh, I won't go into that story. I'm going to jump down. Uh, the The more important part of the story is uh, is what happens with mineral. And we can have all kinds of mineral coating from the first thing that you and I gave us to to very to to smoother coats of varying thickness. And it turns out the failure mechanisms are, are quite sensitive uh, to, to the to, to the uh, actually the deformation mechanisms are quite sensitive to the, the type of coating. And just in one slide, uh, it turns out that that uh, the these thick platelets that that you know gave us the first time, these it, even the fibers themselves were terrible. It wasn't just the, the it wasn't just a construct. These thick platelets barely adhere, but but provide stress concentrations anytime they do. If you have if you have something that's that's uh, that's too thin, then uh, if you have a very thin coating of mineral. It actually gives you more stiffening, but reduces the or reduces the strain to failure. The idea here is is that the uh, is, is that these thin these thin coatings will crack more frequently and and constrain uh, constrain the deformation of the polymer itself. And so you can actually optimize the toughness of these. Anyway, uh, let me skip down to the summary. Possibly not. Okay. There we go. All right. So three things I'd like you to take away from this talk. So the first, is, the first is that it's really important how mineral accumulates on collagen fibrils, and that really determines, that, that really dictates uh, not just the behavior at the, the nano level, but but really be, that that determines across hierarchies the overall tissue behavior. And then there there are three. Uh, there, there are four, really, four important uh, toughening mechanisms that show up at tendon to bone. This is interdigitation, the interlocking. There's gross shaping of the tendon. There's, there's a gradation in mineralization. And then there, there's this toughening across hierarchies, which we're right now trying to recapitulate in PLGA fibers. And then these scaffolds and scaffold materials can be tuned to provide very, very specific material properties. And, uh, and I'd, I'd like to end by thanking you, the American taxpayers, for, uh, for funding this generously. And also, uh, I'd like to, to uh, highlight some of the, the groups who collaborated with this, Victor Berman, Marcus Bueller, uh, who is actually uh, Chinjao today, and, uh, and, and uh, Yanni Tassiotis, who is, who is at Peter Padre Castaneda, and then my, my very close collaborator, Stavros Thermopoulos, from our Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Thanks very much. <laughs>